Hi coders, JC here. Today's video is about the material system. The material system is used to get the material data from the GLTF and FBX loaders to the shaders. But first, welcome to my Game Engine series. This video is part 3 of a mini series revolving around Game Engine basics. In part 1, we added JSON scene descriptions and a scene graph to our engine. In part 2, we looked at the popular 3D file formats GLTF and FBX and introduced the concept of a material. In the next part of this mini-series, we look at instancing. In the last part, we discuss CPU thread pools and KTX. Those five modules should add a solid foundation to our engine. The idea is to load assets efficiently, create test scenarios or entire levels quickly, and prepare our engine on the CPU side for more advanced topics. If you like to see more videos about Game Engine Basics, please let me know in the comments. I'd like to know what you're working on and which field of computer graphics you're interested in the most. Last time, in the video about GLTF and FBX loading, we introduced the concept of materials. We looked at the default PBR node in Blender and saw that a PBR material can either use textures or constant values for material properties. Material properties define, for example, the diffuse color of a mesh. Material properties may also define roughness and metalness, emissive color and emissive strength, and may contain a normal map. Goal number one for the material system. Get the material data from the GLTF and FBX files to the shaders. Goal number two. Support both constant values and textures for material properties. To make the textures available to the shaders, we will look into Vulkan descriptors. Then we saw that some material features are optional. This is, for example, the case for the emissive color. So goal number three is support optional features. Goal number four is to provide resources to the shaders other than material data. This could be, for example, an instance buffer, the bone matrices for skeletal animation, or a height map for terrain. So technically, we will look today at a material and resource system. We will separate the two categories, material and resources, with different classes on the CPU and different descriptor sets on the GPU. Material data and resource data both require descriptors. While the material data strictly comes from the GLTF and FBX loaders, resource data may come from the GLTF and FBX loaders or from elsewhere. To give an example, the instance buffer and skeletal animation buffer are created within the GLTF and FBX loaders. If the shader also needs a height map, this resource must be created before we call the GLTF and FBX loaders. This is because the GLTF and FBX loaders create the descriptors and add them to the submeshes. Then goal number five is to support multiple different materials. For now, we're focusing on the PBR material provided by the GLTF and FBX files. Our material system, however, shall be flexible enough to also handle future resource combinations. Lastly, we want an entry-level material system. It is our goal to prepare the engine for advanced render techniques or maybe a simple game. That being said, it is okay if we have to recompile the engine to add a new shader or material. So goal number six is we want a static material system and do not require dynamic pipeline creation based on description files or shader reflection. As long as the code is easily extensible, we're good. In summary, we want a material system that can get material data to the shaders, support different types of material properties, such as constant values and textures, support optional material features, support other non-material related data, such as buffers, be flexible and extensible for materials other than PBR. The system may be simple, yet effective and may be static. Let's start with the fragment shader. This is where we want to use the material. We need two things, a set of textures and a material struct for features and constant values. The set of textures we loaded from the GLTF and FBX files. We currently support the textures of the PBR default node in Blender, which are a diffuse map for the base color, a normal map for more surface detail, a roughness metalness texture for GLTF files, or individual grayscale textures for roughness and metalness for FBX files, and an emissive map. 
The textures go into Descriptor Set 1. By the way, Descriptor Set 0 is used for global scene data, such as the camera or lights. Descriptor Set 1 contains the textures as just described and is used in the fragment shader. Descriptor Set 2 we use for data buffers, such as an instance buffer, bone matrices or a height map. This set is used in the vertex shader. In my engine, these three sets are required for all 3D models. Because Vulkan guarantees a minimum of four descriptor sets to be supported, you could add yet another set. It could contain, let's say, two spare textures and two spare buffers in case you need some extra data. Then we set next to the material textures, we need a material struct. This struct holds the material features and constant material values. This struct is fairly small, so instead of using a buffer, we use push constants. This is how the struct looks in the shader code. Here on the right hand side, we have defines for material features. They come from a header file that we can share between the GLSL and C++ code. The remaining fragment shader code is simple. It tests the bit vector for features to determine if a material parameter shall be used or not, and if so, if it comes from a texture or constant value. Okay, so this is how the material looks like in the shader and how it is consumed. Before we look at how the GLTF and FBX loaders create the material, let's quickly recap what descriptor sets are. Descriptors are accessors for GPU data. They are advanced pointers. Descriptors point to a memory address on the GPU. On top of that, descriptors also specify access parameters, such as the type of sampler, or a buffer size. Descriptors always come in sets. These sets can be compared to a struct in C++. Even if only a single descriptor is required, it still must be a field of a descriptor set. Descriptors reside in a dedicated memory of the GPU. This is why they must be allocated from a descriptor memory pool. Descriptors are, quote unquote, plugged into a pipeline. You can imagine this as a plug that goes into a receptacle. The plug and receptacle must match. So to plug the descriptor set into the pipeline, or in other words, to bind a descriptor set to a pipeline, the pipeline must be created with a matching descriptor set layout. To deal with descriptor sets, we must A, create a pipeline according to a descriptor set layout, and B, create a matching descriptor set for each material. The pipeline is created once, when the engine starts. In our example, it was for the Blender PBR material. Then for each material, we create a descriptor set from a descriptor memory pool based on the images and buffers we want to use in the shader. The descriptor sets are created when we load the GLTF and FBX models at the start of a scene. Now let's take a look at the CPU side. Here's the material class. This type here, material textures defines an array of material textures. The enum here is used to index into this array. This array is never filled completely as it supports GLTF and FBX at the same time. We can use this array to pass the material textures around in our engine. Slots may or may not be filled depending on the model that we want to load. We can test the array elements for null pointer to check if a slot is used or not. The enum here is the feature bit set that we saw earlier. It uses the same feature bit definitions that are included in the shader. The enum is just used to provide a namespace for those quote unquote C style defines. The PBR material struct here mirrors the struct we saw in the fragment shader. Note that I'm aligning the struct to 128 bytes here. You don't need to do that in your code, but that's the minimum alignment for push constants. I put it there just to bring to your attention that push constants at least occupy 128 bytes. So we said the material textures go into descriptor set 1. Descriptor set 2 is used for resource buffers. The resource class looks similar to the material class. It defines an array of buffers that we can pass around in the engine and an enum to index into this array. Now things are getting interesting. Here's our descriptor factory. We have an API agnostic base class with an abstract interface and static functions to create material descriptors. Down here, we have the derived Vulkan class for material descriptors. 
the two constructors for this class currently take in a material type, which is either PBR or a cube map. The material type is defined up here. The first constructor receives a material texture array, while the second constructor takes in a cube map. The Vulkan Material Descriptor class retains a copy of the material type down here. This member field here, mDescriptor set, is the Vulkan Descriptor set we're after. The Resource Descriptor factory looks similar. On the API agnostic side, it takes in an array of resource buffers. The derived Vulkan Resource Buffer class provides the matching constructor. It holds a descriptor set down here. And here's the meat, the implementation of the Material Descriptor class. This is where the descriptor set for the material is built. It has pointers for the six textures we support in the fragment shader, plus a dummy texture. The dummy texture is used when a texture slot is empty. In this case, the feature bit won't be set and the fragment shader won't use this texture. We still need to fill all descriptors of the descriptor set, hence the dummy texture. Then we build the descriptor set layout and use this layout to create the actual descriptor set. The implementation for the Vulkan Resource Descriptor class looks similar. However, it adds only descriptors as needed. This approach does not require a feature bit set. My engine has different pipelines for these cases. So no if statements in the shader. Instead, it is using multiple vertex shaders slash pipelines. Okay, now we looked at the shader code where the material is consumed and we can create descriptor set one for materials and descriptor set two for buffer resources. What remains is to look at the GLTF loader to see how the material is assigned to a submesh. To wrap the material topic up, we will look at how the descriptor sets are bound to a pipeline. This is the GLTF loader from the last episode. In the constructor, it takes in an optional array of resource buffers that can be populated with data coming from outside the GLTF. The loader can then add an instance buffer or the bone matrices for skeletal animation. In the GLTF loader, the function load materials extracts all materials from a GLTF file. GLTF provides the materials globally. They need to be assigned to submeshes. Here in the implementation of the GLTF loader, it starts by resizing a vector of materials and a vector of material texture arrays. Then it loops over all global materials provided by the GLTF. For each material property, it sets the material feature bit and assigns the material texture. To assign the material to all submeshes of a model slash GLTF node, we looked at this code here in the function create game object. We saw it already in the previous video about GLTF loading. The loop here simply iterates over all submeshes of a model slash GLTF node and calls the function assign materials with the submesh and global material index. In assign materials, the descriptor sets for the material textures and resource buffers are created and added to the submesh. First, it checks if the submesh has a material at all, and if not, it assigns a default material. At this point, the material texture array is complete and the factory to create the material texture descriptor set can be called. For the resource buffer array, the instance buffer and skeletal animation buffers are added here. Then the resource buffer descriptor set is created here. And here we have the submesh structure. It contains all the information required for a draw call. First vertex and first index, and an index and instance count, plus the material and resources. Now let's see how we issue draw calls with this. Here's an overview of the engine. On the left side, we see the application with on start, on update, and on stop. On start loads the JSON scene description files that reference the GLTF and FBX files, their instances, and top level transforms. The JSON scene description file loader calls the GLTF and FBX loaders that load the models and materials. The models are submitted to the render engine, including their vertices, indices, and submeshes, where the submeshes hold the descriptor sets. The lifetime of the models is controlled via the ECS, 
The GLTF and FPX loaders emplace a mesh component into the ECS. This mesh component holds the one and only smart pointer to the 3D model. When a scene is destroyed, the ECS is deleted and with it, the mesh component in the ECS. The ECS is also used to loop over all 3D models that hold a submesh with a certain material, in our case, the PBR material. Here's the code of the render system responsible for PBR. My engine has three PBR material render systems that all use the same fragment shader. Those are regular PBR models, models with skeletal animation and a grass shader. Those pipelines are called from the renderer. Here in the render system for the regular PBR models, we bind the PBR pipeline once per frame. Then we loop over all models tagged with the PBR material. Inside the loop, the instance buffer is updated. This happens only if the transform of any of its instances is changed. More on that in the next episode. Then the render system binds the global vertex and index buffers. If you remember from the last episode, we use submeshes to issue draw calls with ranges out of these buffers. Lastly, the render system calls the function drawPBR of the model. The function drawPBR loops over all submeshes inside the PBR submesh vector. This PBR submesh vector is filled when we submit the model to the engine. In the function copy submeshes, submeshes are sorted into different submesh vectors according to the material. Back to function draw PBR. Inside the loop over all submeshes, it binds the descriptors, pushes the constants into the command buffer and issues the draw call. The function bind descriptors retrieves the material and resource descriptors from the submesh. Together with the global descriptor set for the camera and lights, all three descriptor sets are combined and bound to the pipeline. The function push constants PBR is a single command that retrieves the PBR material struct from the submesh and pushes it into the command buffer. Finally, the function draw submesh issues the draw call. And there we have it. That's our material system to get the GLTF and FBX material data to the shaders. To watch more videos like this one, please consider subscribing. Please like this video and also my engine on GitHub. See you next time. Bye bye.